Agatha Christie's novel, Passenger to Frankfurt, is probably the longest it ever took me to read a Christie novel. It was published in 1970. Let me give you the uh, book jacket rundown of the kind of the inciting incident that, that gets the plot started. There were two passengers in the transit lounge at Frankfurt Airport whose lives were to depend on what took place in the next 30 minutes. Sir Stafford and I was a diplomat returning to London after attending a commission in Malaya. Fog had caused his plane to be diverted via Frankfurt. He would arrive in London two hours late at least. He sighed, yawned, and wished something would happen. He pushed aside the folds of a cloak. It was a his affection to wear when traveling, a kind of bandit's cloak concealing the face which he had once purchased in Corsica. It was noticeable garment, but Stafford and I had liking for the bazaar. A young woman sat down beside him. Her face was vaguely familiar. Someone he had met once, he supposed. She held a magazine but was not reading. She was staring at him. Then suddenly she spoke, a deep contralto voice with a slight foreign accent. May I speak to you? Why not? Stafford and I said lightly. It seems we have time to waste. This casual encounter on a trans-European passenger flight to London was to lead them to strange and unexpected places, to encounters with people as yet unknown to them, into a maze of conspiracy and plotting and danger. Twenty minutes later, Trans-Europe Airlines announced the departure of their flight 309 for London, and in a corner of the transit lounge in Frankfurt, a man in a dark suit lay slumped against the back of his seat, apparently asleep. On the table in front of him was an empty beer glass. Now, this is kind of an interesting beginning to this novel. Um, there, there's kind of a, an immediacy about it, and we wonder what's going to happen when um, when Sir Stafford Knight agrees to give this young woman his passport and his cloak to conceal herself in. Um, and then she, she just suggests that she's going to give him a beer. She'll put some, some something in it that'll cause him to sleep. And he'll wake up a few hours later as if nothing happened, and she'll be able to get out of Germany and into England. So um, from there, this story gets into a plot where he, he meets the young woman again, and, um, and then we're also introduced to this rather disgustingly large toad-like woman who's one of the richest women in the world, and she's controlling everything. Um, she's... Um, She's responsible for all of the political and social unrest in the 1960s all over the world. And it, and the way it's created in this novel is even more dire than it probably actually was. But, you know, there's the drug culture, which uh, this organization sees as a way of killing off the the weak and the, you know, the people with addictive personalities. Um, there were uprisings everywhere. There's been uh, looting and murder and rape and and a very there's a very cynical tone about the about the world and the state that it's in in this novel. Um, it, it seemed a, uh, in a way a little futuristic to me, as if everything was uh, you know kind of under martial law and someone's just waiting for the for complete chaos to take over to t to. Um, kind of usher in uh, a new kind of society. And this new kind of society happens to be a neo-Nazi society. Um, so this, this dreadful woman has somehow um, gotten, uh, is leading a, a, a group of youth that don't even know they're really being led. And uh, their leader is supposedly the bastard son of Hitler, no less, who uh, did not die in the bunker, but uh, was... <laughs> There was someone else, his double was in the bunker, and he escaped to South America and uh, had a bastard son, and this bastard son has a, you know, golden hair and has a beautiful voice and is a very compelling sort of uh, character. Um, from there, the novel gets confusing and boring. It's really, it's really, the pace is slowed by a lot of really boring dialogues, uh, and by the end, um, they, they're trying to seek this man who who created this formula that, this is where it gets really weird, is it's like a, a personality changing formula, almost like tear gas, but instead it makes the person uh, want to be benevolent, and they call it Venvo. And he, he scrapped it after a while because he didn't think that, that uh, it was wise to control a person's behavior, especially because this is a permanent behavioral change. 
Sounds far-fetched? Yes, it absolutely is. I, I can't even begin to tell you what was going on in the end of the novel. Uh, but things end happily for Stafford, uh, personally. Uh, the, the one interesting thing about this is there's a, there's a guy online, I've only read one article by him, and it happens to be about Agatha Christie, and uh, his name's Johan Hari, and he's talking about how Agatha Christie was this radical conservative thinker, and that she had this love of a kind of a, what he described as Burkean uh, philosophy of society, which I think has to do with the, uh, the social order of, um, of England always being kind of the mainstay and the, the, the strong backbone of that society and, and, and keeping up a class system and, and people, get, people step out of line and then order is restored and good old England goes on the way it always has, um, you know, brave and stalwart. And what he does is he makes an interesting comparison uh, between uh, two novels on either end of her career. This one, Passenger to Frankfurt, and the other novel he compares it to is um, The Secret Adversary, which has kind of a fantastic plot as well, when there was a fear of a general strike um, following the First World War. And, um, and in that story, there's a mysterious character named Mr. Brown who is trying to create this general strike so he can seize power and have domination over, you know, England and eventually the world. So he's this madman. Um, the the contrast that Hari describes between the two novels is that Christie's uh, that Christie has had a shift in thinking throughout this uh, throughout her career, um, whereas in the you know early 1920s uh, you know there was a real fear of the um, of a general strike and, and but there was never a doubt in her novel that order would be restored um, and there was generally a very hopeful look toward the future um, that England would always carry on the way it had and uh, in novels of this period you know there's something that ha you know order gets kind of messed up and then order is restored just like in a Miss Marple novel where uh, vil quiet, quaint village life gets kind of messed up and Miss Marple solves the mystery and everything goes back to normal. Uh, by the time we get to Frankfurt, it's, it's not that easy and uh, the author is a bit more cynical about the future. Uh, you know, even at, at one point a character says, oh, well, it must be a good day. There was an, any report of a child being raped and killed. So. Uh, you can tell that she's upset and that, that there's, there aren't as many easy solutions. So from that re so in that respect from you know if you look at it compared to the early, her earliest uh, thriller or espionage novel, this is her last of this kind, um, there's a definite shift in tone. Um, and she still always tries to look for a happy ending, but I, I wasn't really convinced of this one. It was kind of wrapped up weird toward the end. Um, I can't say I recommend reading it unless you're a real diehard Christie fan, um, but it's a, it's a tough read. It, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I have to give it like a two, two and a half out of five stars. Uh, sorry I've been away for so long. Um, i got to finish this thing sometime, but actually I'm, I'm a little loath to do it because I really don't want to get through the whole thing. I want to, uh, you know, kind of keep reading uh, Christie and make it last as long as possible. But I'll try and be better and get them all posted. There aren't very many left now. Um, next one is going to be Nemesis, which I've read before and I really like. It's a, in my opinion, it's a great uh, Miss Marple novel uh, dealing a lot with the past. I don't know what others will think of it, but um, once I read it again, let's talk about it. All right, thanks.